the address book app and we're looking at three things specifically. I'm not going to look at the app from beginning to start. I'm going to focus on three things and these three things sort of go together. All right. First of all, I'm going to look at the database stuff, which we already did, but that was a while ago. So we're going to look at the database stuff again. All right. We're going to look at multiple activities, specifically our app containing more than one activity. And lastly, we're going to look at threading. All right. These things go together. All right. This application is to keep a track of uh, an address book. Um, I suppose we could use shared preferences for this, but that's probably not the best way to go. So we're storing the data in a relational database. All right. So the database stuff comes from the fact that we want persistent storage, and it's more than just like a few parameters here and there. I think, for example, in the rock, paper, scissors, you kept track of like the winning record. That's just like one thing you're storing. You key it based on a date or whatever and you can go down the line. So we want to do some real storage, so we're going to do database stuff. Database stuff is one of those things that relatively speaking can be time intensive. It can tie up the main thread. We'll talk about threads in a minute here, all right, uh, in a bit. So because databases have the potential of tying up the main thread and leading to an unresponsive application, we want to cover threading because we don't want to tie up the main thread. Essentially, your activity starts off in a thread, and that thread responds to any of your user input or gestures or interacting with the device. If you go off and ask to do some database querying, that could potentially, and again, we're talking about like computer scales of time, not like human scales of time. Like we're not talking about like seconds, you know, we're talking about, you know, short periods of time but long from the computer's perspective. If you go off and do a database operation, that could take some time, which means that for that time that that database operation is going on, your UI won't be responsive. Your device won't be responsive. In fact, there's an Android Air. I forget what the exact verbiage of the Air is, but in a nutshell, it tells you, hey, your application isn't responding. When you see that, they probably didn't do threading, all right, because they're running some process that's time consuming and um, therefore if you try to interact with the user interface thread, that thread is not getting any time. So we're going to talk about threading because database is a relatively time consuming operation. There is a, and I don't know if we're going to cover this or not, but one of the DDL examples you can look at if we don't cover it, there's a little like cannon shooting game where you shoot a cannon at little things that are going back and forth. That also has a thread in it because again, that application has to do two things at the same time. It has to move the objects around and it has to respond to you moving your cannon and shooting the can, uh, cannon. If it got caught up moving the things around, it might not be able to respond to you shooting the cannon. So we do some threading. So those two things go together for that. Database uh, stuff goes together with multiple activities because typically we want to do some different things with the database stuff. A very typical, a very standard sort of thing to do is to show uh, within apps, whether it be iPhone or Android, is to show a list of things and if you click on one of the items in the list you get to see uh, the details about it. So in the contact example 
we have a list of contacts that fires up when the app starts. And if you click on it, it brings it up to see the details of it. The list may only have part of the data. In other words, the list might show like the contact, last name, and first name, whereas the screen is the details. Sometimes that's called like a header detail or master detail where you have a list of a bunch of items and then you drill down to see all the details about one of the items. Those two different things are different activities. You know, think of an activity in terms of something you want the user to do. All right? See a list of your contacts is something you want the user to do. Go and view the details of a contact is something you want the user to do. Last, lastly, edit or add a new contact is something you want the user to do. Therefore, each of these is an activity where you're presenting a screen that the user can do something at. That was the best uh, definition or description I've heard of an activity where you present the user a screen that they can do like one sort of thing on. All right. And if they go to another screen where they can do a different sort of thing, that's probably another activity. So database stuff lends itself for that. So I think that's the reason that these three things are lumped into this example. The database thing, well, because we want to do some real persistent storage. The threading, well, if we're going to do database stuff, we don't want to tie up the main thread. And finally, multiple activities, well, we want to do some different things with this. So again, we're not going to look at the whole app, but we're going to look at these pieces specifically. Have a device. I don't know if there's any power to it. There is. Just a little bit. a little more power. All right, address book. Here we go. <coughs> All right, activity number one. We get a list of the contacts in our address book. Activity two, if we hit the menu, we can add a contact. That's a different screen, right? We're asking the user to do something else. We're not looking at a list of contacts. We can enter in a contact. I can type in my new contact, hit save. I'm back to the other activity, all right? Typically, when you call and invoke an activity, when the activity finishes, you go back to the activity then that invoked it. And then go and viewing that, itself is its own activity just as editing it or deleting it would be an activity. All right, let's review the database stuff that we already did and let us go and do the rest of the database stuff and then we can talk about activities and finally threading. Notice we followed good 
I say we like I was the one that wrote this. Deedle followed a good practice of encapsulation in that all the database stuff is in one place. So he has a separate data connector Java, separate class that handles the database connectivity. All right. And we can see we create this. We have some constructors on the class. We have one or two constructors. We have one constructor, and then we have an open. Get writable database. Again, that opens a pipeline to the database that's read and write. The interesting thing that we looked at last time is we had in here code. when we initially created the database. So when we install the app, we don't have the database yet until we run the app. When we run the app, the first time it tries to open the database, it's going to look, see that the database isn't there, and it is going to run. I better move this mouse. I keep touching it, and that's the PC's mouse, not not there. It's going to run this create to create the database. And in there we have actually a SQL create table statement. All right. Normally in like the basic database class you cover statements to do like selects, maybe an insert, update, or delete, and maybe you do those in other classes. The create statement is something you could do to actually create a table. So, if the database is, does not exist, you create a query to create the table and the structure that you needs, need. If you had more than one table in your database, if you had contacts and email addresses or phone numbers or whatever, whereas one contact could have a bunch of phone numbers associated with them, then you'd have several creates in here to create multiple tables in your database. But this case, they wanted to keep it simple, so there's simply one instruction to create it. And we'll go and run that query, and we will create the database. So the, and the first time you run it, you create the database. Here's something important. If I were to go and change something about the table, like if, let's say, I was working on this, and I looked and I said, you know what, there's no zip code here. Let me go and add a zip code in there. If I went and ran it, it's going to fail. All right? It's going to fail because the database was created without a zip code. And now there's a zip code in there. Now I want to try to put a zip code in there. All right? So therefore, your best bet, if you've created the database and you decide that you want to change the database, all right, the most straightforward thing to do would be to simply uninstall off of your device. And you could uninstall off the emulator as well. That will start things fresh, and then you can get a fresh install, and it will create the database with a new structure. Now, you can't do that if you've already deployed your application, right? You can't say, well, gee, guess what? Delete your database and reinstall my application and start with a new database. You know, could you imagine someone had 100 contacts in there? Go and re-enter all 100 of them with a new database structure. Wouldn't, you wouldn't get a very good rating in the Play Store if you did that. That's where you have this on upgrade method, where you could specify SQL statements that would alter the database to account for the new stuff. For example, there is a, and I'm a little fuzzy on this because it's been a while since I read it, uh, wrote this kind of code. You can either create a column or you alter a table to create a column. But there's a syntax to add a column to the database. So you would put that in your upgrade. And in fact, this upgrade gets past an old version and a new version. So you could test if they went from version 1 to version 2, you can make the version 2 changes. If they went from version 1 to version 3, 
you could make the one to two changes and the two to three changes. Where if they were going from two to three, you could just make the two to three changes. So you could have a big if statement wrapped around your SQL statements to only call those that are relevant for this particular case. You know the starting version, the original version of the database, and the new version. All right? That's the creation of the database. So the first time you run the app, the first time the database is open, it's going to try to get a pointer to, to write to it. If that database doesn't exist, it runs this code. We have five other database commands in here. We have an insert, we have an update, we have a delete, and then we have two queries. One of the queries is to give me everything. One of the queries is to give me the specific person that I want. So in other words, when I first load the page, I get everyone. When I click on a particular contact, I only see that contact. So, here is the insert statement. I will leave it up to you to look through this app, download and look through this app to see how this gets called. It's pretty basic, really, when you click save, if you're on the add activity, it goes in and it passes to this insert contact method the name, the email, the phone, the state, and the city. I create a new contact. This is type content values. This again is sort of like um, a shared uh, preferences. It's an ordered pair where I have a name of a field and the value for it. So I'm creating these and you'll, you'll have one of these puts for everything that you're, every column that you're adding to the table. I open the table. I insert into the contacts table. This is where I'm getting the values from, this content values object, and then I close the database. Now I would hope whoever calls this has some code wrapped in a try catch, all right, in case this fails. Um, we'll have to, we'll, we'll take a quick look at that. The edit is mostly the same. The difference being is with an edit, you need to specify what field you're editing. Therefore, if you look at the database update command, we have everything that we had before, but, you know, here's the data that we're getting. Here is the table that we're updating. The other thing we get, have there is we have a where clause effectively. The WHERE clause is equals ID equals ID, or underscore ID equals ID. So this method gets passed in the ID of the, ta of the, of the row that you're changing. All right? If we look back when we created that table, the ID is an integer, and it's an auto-increment which means that the database automatically sets that field incrementally, one, two, three, four, and so on. We need that because we don't want to update everything. We want to update just a specific row. What would happen if we didn't have this here, if we had a null there instead? Well, the update command would work but remember, when you don't have a WHERE clause on a SQL statement, what does that mean? That means everything. So if I change the name of the person to Michael instead of Mike, if I did not have that, that blue highlighted thing, ID equals ID in there, then it would update every single person's first name. So with updates and deletes, typically you're going to pass the primary key in. Because updates and deletes, you don't want to delete everyone. You don't want to update everyone. You only want to 
update or delete the one person that you've selected. All right. So that's the difference between the insert and the update. The insert doesn't have a where clause because with an insert, you're simply inserting one row in the table. With the update, you could potentially update more than one row. Sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes you actually do want to do that. An example I could think of, maybe not in this application, but in another application, is I might want to assign every Ohio sales rep to Smith and every Michigan sales rep to Jones. You know, let's say that um, you know I started off I had a small company that worked in the Ohio, Michigan area, and there was one sales rep that handled everyone. Well, we started growing and we decided, okay, Smith is going to handle Ohio, Jones is going to handle Michigan. I could write a SQL statement that would say, update sales rep, set the sales rep equal to Jones, where the state equals Michigan. All right? And then I would update all the customers that were located in Michigan. So you don't always want to use a primary key. But in apps and in applications, often you do, right? Because often you're pointing at that one row and saying, I want to change this one row. Well, how do I guarantee that I change one row and only one row? I give it the primary key, all right? And I give it in a where clause. The delete is easier still. That's not the delete. Here's the delete. Easier still. With a delete, there's no values that I give it. I just say I want to delete this row. Well, what row do I want to delete? If I want to guarantee that I'm deleting one row and only one row, I better give it the primary key, right? Because the primary key guarantees that there's only one row. Um, that, that's going to get um, be affected. Again, if I omitted that where clause, I would delete everything. I could have something else in a where clause, but not in this case where I click on the item that I want to do something with, and then if I want to delete it, I want to delete just that specific item. All this stuff gets called from... Add edit contact. We'll take a little bit of a look on how that is used. Here's the save button. Here's the lister for the save button. We're creating a asynchronous task, and that's what we're going to talk about later on. That's where the threading gets in. We do a little validation. We make sure the name is not empty. But if everything is okay, we go and we execute the save contact, and the save contact method creates a database object, database connector object, looks at this, which we'll ignore for now, but then it uses that to determine whether it's an insert or an update. If it's an insert, I call on the database connector my insert command and I get the value from the different text boxes. If I, if there is something in that field, in other words, I'm displaying and editing a field, then I invoke the update command. So we take the values from the text box and we either call the insert or the update, depending on whether we're adding a new one or we're editing an existing one. And this is the flag 
that determines whether we're editing or um, inserting. We'll look at that when we look at activities. If I was going to write a comment, I would say, look to see if something was passed. If nothing's passed, we're doing an insert. If something's passed, we're doing an update. So if nothing is passed, we're doing an update. If something's passed, we're doing an insert. All right. And there's something similar for delete somewhere in here. Maybe not. I think the delete might be on the other, one of the other activities. We also have in our database object two queries. One is get all contacts, one is get one contact. If you notice, it calls that query method. We could almost guess what that query method does. It forms a select statement. If we wanted to display the name and the ID for a particular, if we wanted to display all the names and IDs in the database, in the contact table, our select statement would look like this. Select name ID from contacts. And it would probably say order by name. Effectively, that's what this function does. What table do I want? I want the contacts table. That, so the first argument represents the table. What field do I want? The array represents the fields that I want, ID and name. I just put them in the reverse order on mine. These other things represent the other parts of a SQL statement. Where clause, um, order by, group by, so on. I'm sorry, not the order by. The order by is the last one. The last argument is the order by, so that's what makes it ordered by name. Now if we look at this, the difference between these two is that we're doing a select and we're not saying the list of columns. What does that mean? It means we want all the columns. From contacts, we have a WHERE clause. Where ID equals whatever gets passed in as the ID. So what's the difference between this SQL statement and the other? This SQL statement is going to give us one row. It's going to give us one contact. It's going to give us every column in that table because we didn't specify which columns we want. But it's only going to give us one because we're, only, we're pulling it up based on the ID. Whereas the other one, we were, had no where clause, so we were getting everything, but we were only getting the ID and the name. Because on that first screen where we display everything, we don't, we're not displaying where we display every row, we're not displaying every column. We're just displaying the name, and we need the ID sort of behind the scenes to do the processing. So, get one content. Both of these, if you notice, get all contacts and get one contact, return a cursor. All right? kind of a funny name, especially for those of you that think, think of a cursor as like the blinking thing on the screen. A cursor really is a list, the results of a query. All right? It's a list of items. 
And it's a list, the, the, the reason that they call it cursor is a cursor on your screen shows you the place where you are. So, you know, you're at this point. If you start typing, that's where your words are going to come in. This kind of cursor keeps track of where you are within the database results, within the query results. So what we do is we loop through the cursor. We say, for example, when we display everything, we ask for, give me the first contact in the cursor. Give me the next contact, the next contact, the next contact, until we run out of contacts. So that's sort of where the name cursor is, is we just ask for the fields, the rows, in the result set in order. We keep asking for the next one, and the cursor keeps track of where we are in the list. So that's really all that cursor means. Now. That's how you return data um, from database queries. Now, in the case of getting one contact, our cursor is always, by definition, only going to have at most one thing in it. All right? Because we're selecting based on the primary key. So, if we look here in the add change contact, We'll talk a little bit more about this when we talk about activities, but if we're editing an activity, this activity gets passed as part of this intent extras, the ID that we want. So we use that ID, we pull that ID, all right? Actually, it gets a bunch of fields from there. It gets the ID. It gets the name, it gets the email, so it gets everything. All right? And it populates those text boxes. So if we go and change it, then we go and do an update. All right? If there's nothing in there, we don't initialize those text boxes. So we use the same activity for an update and an insert. The only difference is, is we are going to do an update if something gets passed into it. We're going to do an insert if nothing gets passed into it, if you start with a blank slate. Let's look at the view content activity. This is what we click on when we are, or this is what we get when we are viewing the list of contacts and we click on one. First we get the view contact, then if we make the menu selection for update, we go to the update activity. So, this activity gets passed in The row ID, all right? The row ID, if you remember, is the primary key, all right? We load contact task. That load contact task does some threading things that we'll talk about later, and it calls my get one contact method, and it passes it the ID. So we only get one. Now, a cursor can handle multiple things. This cursor doesn't know that it's only ever going to have one thing. So we have to move to the first field in the cursor, or first row in the cursor, even though by definition this only has one row. And then we get from the cursor the name, phone number, email, street, and city. And we stuff those into the, um, stuff those into the different text fields. Here's where the delete lives, and if they make a, a, an option to delete this, we go and we run that piece of code. So the only thing we have, we have a couple things left as far as SQL goes. 
before we start getting into looking at the activities aspect of this. What we have from the sequel is the very initial screen where we bring up all of the contacts. So let's look at that. doing a little bit differently than previous activities. If you notice, this is defined as a list activity. A list activity has associated with it an adapter. This is very much like those of you that have done ASP.NET. How many of you have done that one, the 243? How you have a sort of like a SQL data source and then you have like a grid view or something like that. A list view would be, in this case, sort of like the grid view. A list activity, I'm sorry, would be like a grid view in ASP.NET. The cursor adapter, the adapter for this, is sort of like the data source. So here we're saying that we got a list. It's a list activity. It's not a plain old activity. We define our adapter as being a simple cursor adapter, and I'm sure there's other options, but we've chosen an adapter. And we associate that adapter with this activity. So all we do then is when we go and do this at some point we do a get all contacts and when that succeeds we set the contact adapter to the cursor that we got as a result so whatever we retrieved from that get all contacts that gets set as the adapter, and therefore that's what, get dis that's what gets displayed in the list view. All right. Again, since this is the first activity, this would be where the database gets created. The first time we create and open that database connection and it sees that the database isn't there, that's when it's going to go fire off and run that uh, create statement. So let's review. Ups, updates, inserts, and deletes are done via something that looks like this. There's a database update, a database insert, and somewhere a database delete. These things generate SQL statements. All right? Each of the arguments of these functions represents parts of the SQL statement. And we can look them up if we want to know definitively. We can sort of figure out and assume. If we look at if we do a Google here, and look up SQLite database update statement. If we look at the documentation, We can, see, we can see exactly what those arguments mean. First argument is the table that we want to update. The second is a list of values stored in that content values. 
The third piece is a where clause. Fourth piece is the where arguments. So that's what an update statement looks like. An insert statement has a table, has null column hack. I'm not sure what that is. I think if we look in our examples, it was always set to null. And then the con content values. If we look at a query, We have a couple options on that, but the one we're using is we ask for the table that we want, we ask for the columns that we want, we ask for the selection and selection arguments, that is the where clause, we ask if there's a group by, we ask if there's a having clause, and then finally we have a order by clause. So, kind of without writing SQL, you can let it write the SQL for you. These, I'm sure, translate directly to SQL statements. And you even have a choice, if you'd rather, to write a raw query, or you just put in the SQL statement and let it figure out what to do. All right, or, you, or rather, you figured out what to do. You don't let the object figure out what to do. So that's our insert, update, and deletes. We use these functions that exist on the SQLite database object in Android. And of course, we're going to call methods that get the values from our text boxes or our drop downs or spinner controls or whatever. And then we're going to invoke the insert, update, and delete. The queries, the difference between the query and these other SQL statements is that the query returns a cursor. And a cursor effectively is a list of items that we can either plug into an adapter for a list so that it will populate the list. Or we can grab values individually like we do when we go to that page. Questions over any of this? That's the SQL portion of this discussion. Next portion that I want to talk about is I want to talk about the activity portion. All right? So let's go and let's look at our main activity. not this one. I think it's this one. Here we go. Our main activity, the address book, which extends list activity. All right. What invokes another activity? Two things invoke an, another activity in this example. One of them is when we click on a contact. So we have our contacts. When we click on one of them, we invoke the view contact. All right, that's a different activity, different screen. We present a different screen in front of the user, that's a different activity. The other way we invoke an activity is if we click Add Contact from this menu, we go to the Edit, Add Edit, or Insert Edit Contact activity. So let's look at how these two things get, um, what do I want to say, how these two things get invoked. So let's look at the... Let's look at the insert first. We have our menu, all right? I'm inflating the menu and I'm setting the menu based on my XML, so I'm doing it the new way, not the old way, all right? Um, if I select an option, it's a little bit of sloppy coding, but we'll excuse them because there's only one 
menu option. So we don't have to test to see which option got selected. All right. We know that if they selected a menu option, that they selected insert. So what are we doing? We create an intent. Just as the name implies, the intent says that I intend, this application intends to start another activity. All right? It intends to start another activity. It's outside of the realm of this class, right? I mean, th not this course, but this class. It's calling, it's invoking another class to run this activity. The activity it's running might not even be part of this app, right? I could, for example, invoke the camera activity to bring up the camera. Like, let's say I had one of them silly little apps where you could take a picture, bring it back, and then draw over top of it, all right? I'm not going to write my own code to handle the camera, right? There's already the camera app that does that. So I'm going to have a button that says, within my app, that says, take picture. That's going to create an intent for the camera. The camera app will start, let me take the picture. That picture gets returned back to my activity, and then I can go and draw a mustache on it or whatever. All right? So I'm creating an intent, and I'm saying what app is calling the intent, and what is it that we want to do. Then we start the activity. All right, now, let's go back. I go and I click the menu, and I click Add. Maybe this doesn't do menus the old way, or new way. Maybe it does do them the old way, but anyhow. All right, I'm in this activity. When do I go back to the first activity? I go back to the first activity after I have finished this activity. This activity stays until I'm done with it. All right? So my code just starts the activity, and this activity is just going to sit there and wait for it to get done. All right? What do you want to do when this activity gets done? When this activity gets done, Got a little confused for a second. This on resume event fires off because we've resumed that activity. And what does this do? This goes and reads the contacts again so that if I've added a contact, it will now appear on the list. That's why this code, by the way, is in the on resume and not the on create. Because we don't want to do this just once when we created the app. We want to do this when the app resumes as well. What happens if we click on one of the contacts in the list? We have an on-click listener for the item. And what do we do? We create the view contact intent. And notice what we do with this intent. We do a put extra, all right? The put extra is a mechanism by which this calls the second page, the view page, and passes it what contact we want to view. 
What contact do we want to view? We want to view the row ID. All right? So, this long argument three represents the view that we've clicked on, or I'm sorry, the row that we've clicked on, the ID of the row that we've clicked on. We pass that by putting it in this extra. The extras associated with the activity, all right, what they do is they're a mechanism to pass things between the activities. In the case of an ad mode, there's really nothing to pass to the ad screen. Because when we go and add a new contact to the list, we don't really pass any data. We start with a blank screen, and the user can fill it in. When I want to view, however, a contact, I need to tell that view screen, that view activity, which contact I want to view. So I have to pass that ID to the second activity, the view contact activity. So we pass it that way, and the view activity first thing it does is it grabs from the extras the row ID. So it grabs from the row ID, I'm sorry, it grabs from the extras the row ID that we want to display. All right. So that's the mechanism by which that second page knows which contact to display. So put in a nutshell, this intent The intent is saying we want to start a new activity. All right. The extras is used for data that we want to pass back and forth. Depending on what activity you're calling, the extras are going to be different in each case. If I call the camera, for example, my app won't necessarily pass anything to the camera. It will just tell the camera, take a picture for me. After the camera takes a picture, though, it's going to use the extras to pass back to my activity the image that it took. So those extras are used going in both directions. In this case, we're going from the list activity to the view contact activity. So what we are passing is we are passing the um, we're passing the ID of the contact we want to view. Uh -huh. It says address book this, then it says view contact dot class. That view contact dot class is the class you're going to with the extra stuff going to. This. Exactly. In other words, this intent, what this is saying, this is saying that, yeah, I'm the one that address book dot this means, yeah, I'm the one that's calling this. When you're done, resume this one. View contact dot class is the new activity that we want to start. All right. Associated with this intent object is also some extras that get passed. So we're going to start this activity, all right, and we're going to pass it those extras. Isn't it, um, I'm trying to figure out how you define if I was writing both of them, if I was responsible for mm -hmm. writing. Well, it depends on what you want to pass it. You, ha you have to, and, and we'll see, and we'll see at the next view that we look at. Um, in this case, we're only passing one thing. Okay. All right, let's let's draw on the board. Let's draw on the board what we're doing. is a contact. 
Each one of these has an ID associated. If I go, if I click on this and go to the view page, I'm going to pass it the ID. Why? Because this page is going to do a database query to pull all the fields for that ID. So I'm going to give it the ID. I'm going to read the database and get the name, address, email, city, and state. All this screen has, all the list has, is a name and an ID. So this being the view contact page, I have to pass the ID so that I can execute the SQL statement to get all of the fields to populate this. All right. So in this case, I'm passing the one thing. That one thing is the ID. Once that ID is over here, I do the query to pull everything and populate my form. All right. I have an add menu button somewhere. When I click on that, I go to the add edit view, or insert edit view, whatever it's called. What do I have to pass it? Nothing. Why not? I'm with an add, with an insert, you start with a clean slate. So I call this add edit, or insert, insert update. What, let me get the precise name of it. It is the add edit contact I was right the first time. I don't have to pass anything because an ad, which we're coming from, starts out with a clean slate for name, address, city, state, and so on. Now, and I'm pretty sure they just did this because this, this is a great question. I'm pretty sure the example, Dito's example, does it the way that they did this to demonstrate just a couple different ways you can do it. Because here, there's an edit field and a delete. The delete doesn't call another activity, so we don't have to worry about that in this discussion. The edit calls the same activity, but it passes everything. It passes the name, address, email, city, and state. All right. So this is the way they chose to do it. And let me try to explain, or let, let's discuss why they did it this way. Why did they only pass the ID from here to here? That's all that's really needed, and that's all that this really has. So those two things taken together, right? That list only has the name and the ID. List has a name and ID. So I can't display, I can't pass all the information this page needs. But I can pass the ID. And once I pass the ID, I can do the query to pull everything else up. All right? I don't pass anything here. Well, that one's pretty straightforward. It's an ad. Start with a clean slate. Why do I do this differently? Why don't I just pass the ID here? Why don't I just pass the ID here? Why do I pass those five or six fields? That way you don't have to query the database a second time. That view page does have everything that the edit page needs. So why make the edit page query the database again? All right. So it's going to pass everything. And in that way, I don't need to do a query.
query again. It'll make the make code run a little more efficient. I don't even have to worry about like you would like you might have to worry in in like mainframe or um, web applications that someone else could be editing that, right? This is a handheld device, right? <laughs> you know, no one else is gonna be editing that, just you. So I don't have to worry about that one in a million shot that someone changed that field from there to there. Right? I don't have to worry about concurrency issues or anything like that because it's a single user environment. All right. So that's why we did it that way. That's why they did it that way. They could have just passed the ID, but that would have forced the app to work a little harder and do a second query. I suppose they could have rewritten this to remember somehow all the information about a contact so that when we call it, we could fill in that. But that seems a lot of work when we might not even necessarily need it. All right. So now we're just going to show the ID. We're just going to we're just going to have the name and, and and store the ID behind the scenes. Are you passing the name, and address, and email? Is it separate strings? Or yes, it's it's object? separate strings. Oh, you're not passing an object to. It? No, we'll we'll look at it in a second. Okay. We'll we'll look at uh, we'll look at the code in a second to pass that. Here's view contact in a minute here. Remember, view contact, what does it get past? Gets past the ID, right? Why does it get past the ID? Well, that's all the list has. So the list gets it from somewhere. You can review. This is arg3. You can read through the code to see where it got the ID from. But it gets passed into here. We do the query and we populate all those fields. Now, notice what happens when we click to edit the item. All right. Here, when we were just passing the ID, We just put one thing in the extras, just the ID. Here, we're passing a bunch of things in the ID, or we're passing a bunch of things along with the ID, rather, a bunch of things associated with the intent, and therefore we put extra, so we can put extra as many fields as we want, each one of them being a, a string field. All right, and then, we go in and we start that activity, all right? So now, we start that activity. What does that edit activity do? Or add, add edit uh, contact. First thing it does is it looks to see if there's anything in the extras, all right? I don't like that that comment. That comment really doesn't tell you anything. It just explains you what that statement of code does. It should explain to you why you have the key or why you have that line of code. Essentially what it's doing is it's determining if it's an add or an edit. All right. 
if there's something in the extras, there's an edit. All right? If there's something in the extras, that means that we called this and passed yeah we called that we started that intent and passed all these things on the extras so if there's something on the extras we're going to use those things to populate the text box so we don't have to do a database query because we're just passing them if there's nothing in the extras, that means we're doing an insert. And therefore, we don't populate anything. We just start with a blank form. And again, we have one save button, but the save button is smart enough to know, was there anything in the extras? If there was nothing in the extras, then we want to do an insert. If there was something in the extras, we wanted to do an update. So that's how we put that contact content out there as part of the extras. And here's where we pull it off to set the text um, for that. So we start in tenths. In tenths. It's hard to say. I don't want to say like grr, in tenths that way. We start an intent, and we can optionally pass data using the extras from intent A to intent B. When this intent ends, all right, we go back and we call, we go back to the intent that called it. And we resume in this case. We'll see other examples that an intent can actually return something back to whoever called it. Again, think of my draw mustache on someone app. We take the, we call it, we start an intent to, to call the camera. It takes a picture. Well, we want to return that picture back to our app so we can draw the mustache on the guy. All right? So it can go the other way, too. This example doesn't really have anything that goes the other way. All right? We just go and uh, call that and uh, pass it data, but we don't really get any data back from this. Questions. The last thing that we're going to cover, and we'll cover that on Wednesday, is threading. I want to make sure we understand conceptually what's going on, and then we can look to see specifically what's going on um, in the code. All right. That's all I had. The remainder of the time is your time for lab.